Um, I'd like to start by thanking three people for today. Natty and Elizabeth. For, for, for arranging the event and for putting so much work into it. And, uh, and also, somebody who, um, to me, is one of the unsung heroes of the men's rights movement, quite, quite frankly, and without whom there would not be YouTube videos of the last four international conferences on men's issues or, or, or these events. Anthony J. Cornish III, a.k.a. Tom. Hi. Tom! <laughs> and at, at the... At the Chicago conference, I had the huge pleasure in awarding him the Quentin Tarantino um, Award for Directing Excellence. And, he, wow. and there were only very few, few of us who knew about it. And he didn't. His face was a picture, I've got to say. OK, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to draw on our last general election man, man, manifesto on the issue of abortion, particularly relating to the situation in the UK. Elective abortions are permissible in the UK up to 24 weeks after conception. When the 1967 Abortion Act was passed, 24-week-old fetuses were not viable. But with the passage of time and the advance of medical technology, they increasingly are viable. So in the same hospital in the UK today, one medical team could be fighting to save the life of a 24-week-old fetus, while another medical team is killing a fetus of exactly the same age. I find that obscene. There comes a point when the basic right to life of an unborn child overrides, overrides the right of a woman over her body. One person's rights end when another person's, where another person's rights begin. In an age where contraception has long been readily available and highly reliable, women should be held morally accountable for the children they conceive. We believe there's a point in pregnancy when society and the law needs to recognise the right of the unborn child to life. When the 1967 Abortion Act was passed, the British public was assured it wouldn't lead to abortion on demand. That assurance has, predictably, proved utterly hollow. Abortion on demand has been freely available in the UK for over half a century. Now, there's a growing awareness that 97% of the abortions carried out in England, Wales and Scotland are carried out on grounds which may be illegal. The Abortion Act permits elective abortions on the, sorry, to be performed on numerous grounds when authorised by two medical practitioners. One of the grounds is to reduce the risk of injury to the mental health of women. Now in 2012 in England and Wales over 185,000 abortions were carried out. Over 180,000 of them 97% were carried out under grounds C of the Abortion Act, which stipulates the following. The pregnancy has not exceeded its 24th week and the continuance of the pregnancy would involve risk, greater than if the pregnancy were terminated, of injury to the physical or mental health of the pregnant woman. Of those 180,000 abortions, 99.94% were carried out on the grounds of reducing the risk of injury to the woman's mental health. Only 109 abortions, 109, 0.06% of the total, were carried out on the grounds of reducing the risk of injury to the woman's physical health. But here's the thing. There is absolutely no evidence to support the thesis that abortion reduces the risk uh, to mental health of women with an unwanted pregnancy. None. Clinical trials to investigate the matter would, of course, be highly unethical. There is, however, some evidence to suggest that abortion itself increases the risk to mental health, so medical practitioners who authorise abortions on mental health risk grounds are doing so in the knowledge that there is no body of research to support th those, those authorisations. In December 2011, the National Collaborating Centre for Mental Health <laughs> produced a 252-page report for the, for the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges, titled Induced Abortion and Mental Health, a systematic review of the mental health outcomes of induced abortion, including their prevalence and associated factors. Among the key, factors of the, uh, among the key findings of the report was this. The rate 
of mental health problems for women with an unwanted pregnancy were the same whether they had an abortion or gave birth. In April 2013, the Australian and New Zealand Journal of Psychiatry published a report titled, Does Abortion Reduce the Mental Health Risks of Unwanted or Unplanned Pregnancy? A reappraisal of the evidence. The full conclusion of, the, of that report was this. There is no available evidence to suggest that abortion has therapeutic effects in reducing the mental health risks of unwanted or unintended pregnancy. There is suggestive evidence that abortion may be associated with small to moderate risks, sorry, increases in risks, risks to anxiety, alcohol misuse, illicit drug use, and suicidal behavior. And who in this room could be surprised by that? In our manifesto, we made proposals in three areas. Number one, the Abortion Act 1967 should be amended to limit women's rights to have an abortion on the grounds of reducing the risk of injury to their mental health to a maximum of 13 weeks after conception. At this stage, the gender of the embryo is unclear, so this would result in the end of gender-specific abortions, the incidence, the incidence of which in the UK is a matter of some dispute. Number two, the Abortion Act 1967 should remain unchanged with respect to women's rights to have abortions carried out on the grounds of reducing the risk of injury to their physical health. And number three, it should be a criminal offence for a British woman to have an abortion outside the UK more than 13 weeks after conception on grounds other than reducing the risk of injury to her physical health. I'd like to continue with a thought experiment. I'd like you to imagine, this is gonna be really difficult for this audience, I'd like to imagine yourselves living in a patriarchy. <laughs> I, I know, but please, 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 let's, let's, let's try this. Um, and more specifically, a patriarchy as envisaged by feminists, one in which men as a class oppress, oppress women and girls as a class for the benefit of men and boys, and as they have for millennia. So, so please, please stick with me with this. In this patriarchy, of course, women wouldn't have the vote. Right. Um, <laughs> who said that? Let's further imagine that in 1967 an act was passed, not the Abortion Act, but an act that gave fathers of babies up to 24 weeks of age the right to have their babies killed by doctors at taxpayers' expense without fear of punishment. Mothers would have no legal right to stop the killing of their babies. In the 52 years since the act was passed, over 10 million babies have been killed at the, at the behest of their fathers. And every year, another 180,000 or 200,000 plus are killed. Fathers justify their right to have their babies killed with the slogan, my baby, my choice. Now, if we do a, if we do a parent gender switch, rather than babies under 24 weeks of age being killed at the behest of their fathers, we have fetuses under 24 weeks of age being killed at the behest of their mothers, the reality of abortion in the UK since 1967. Now, of course, there are, there are differences between a 24-week-old baby and a 24-week-old fetus, but neither are viable without external support and protection. In the case of the fetus, that of its mother. Both killings seem to me to be morally equivalent. Now, I've been an atheist for about 45 years since I was a teenager, difficult to believe. Um, but it's all too evident to me that with the, with the decline of religion in the UK, and the decline of Christianity in particular, the nation's moral compass has been well and truly shattered. Nobody in their right mind would advocate for the right of fathers to have their babies killed. Yet society turns a blind eye to the killing of unborn children under the name of women's rights. I look forward to a future of MRAs increasingly working with religious people on matters of common interest, including abortion. <laughs> Among other things, feminism is a death cult, and no group in the world is keener on abortion than feminists. They are keen on the rights of women to kill their unborn children, and they have not the slightest interest in the responsibility of women to protect them. That's been a theme of feminism from the beginning. Ever more rights, ever fewer responsibilities. The, the, the rallying cry of feminists with, with respect to abortion is, of course, my body, my choice. And why is that? As always with feminists, it's about power. 
By stating that only women can decide on abortion, women gain power over life and death, and men are denied it. We would be appalled by a man who raped a woman, or a man for that matter, who said in his defense, my body, my choice. And why? Because the crime has a victim, whether a, whether a woman or a man. The most obvious victim in abortions is, of course, the, the unborn child who is killed. But there, but there are other victims, most notably the father of the unborn child, who may desperately wish to see it born and develop. He may even be willing to be the sole parent of the child. No matter. The woman has all the power, the man none. How many men have suffered grievously because women in this country have unilaterally decided to kill 10 million unborn children since the 1967 Abortion Act? I suspect some millions of them. The feminist position that half of humanity has no right to be heard on the, on the, on the issue of abortion is nothing short of obscene. Abortion is a men's issue as well as a women's issue. Thank you.